So next, we have our keynote speaker who's joining us from Hamburg, Germany, probably as the first thing for his Friday, since uh, I hope it's sunny over there as for his morning. So he's Eric, a head of technology for ThoughtWorks Germany. And throughout Eric's 25 years in technology, he has witnessed the rise and sometimes the fall of many technologies. Always curious, he seeks to understand the potential of these new technologies while trying to figure out how to apply hard-won experience and proven practices. He's also an advocate of agile values and open source software. So today, he will be providing our keynote speech, uh, Architecture Without Architects. What a wonderful name. I'm so curious to know how this is possible. And let's give a warm welcome to Eric for the closing keynote of today. So hello, thank you very much for the warm welcome. And let's dive straight into the topic. I'm happy to hear that the title piqued your interest. I hope I can, I can satisfy and explain what we are talking about and why it can actually make sense, as you alluded to, because it is not totally obvious how that can work. To start, let me share my slides, which you should hopefully see now. Yes, we can. Good. Very good. Cool. So architecture without architects. Let's start to talk about architects to, to kick this off, really. What is an architect? And I guess in computer science, which is a relatively young discipline, we are borrowing words, we are taking metaphors, we are taking terms from other disciplines to describe better what we are doing. And there was one thing, I guess many of us recognized when writing software, it wasn't just writing code at a very early stage already, 30, 40 years ago, there was more than just writing a few lines of code to solve a business problem. And we were looking for a term and the term that had been applied in other disciplines as well was this metaphor of architecture. Sometimes, and I know this at least, the real building architects aren't even that happy about other people calling themselves architects. So they, they really want to make sure that we call ourselves at least software architects or something to distinguish from the true architects. But nonetheless, I think it is important to briefly look at what real architects are doing. And if you look at that picture, the architect is the one with the white helmet. He's the one who's drawing the plans. He's actually not really drawing the plans. He's actually the one who probably did the broad strokes designs. The plan that we're seeing in the hands here were probably done by structural engineers, by other people. And these plans, if you look at them, they are super detailed. You can see the physical size in the picture of that plan. But what is also, and I guess this is intuitively clear to all of us, but not often talked about, when you look at those plans and in the detail, you will see that they are very low level of abstraction. For example, if you look at the skyscraper in the background that has 10, 20, 30 stories, it has multiple similar windows. But in these architectural plans, we don't have those abstractions that we take for granted when we write software. If you want 10 stories, you're probably drawing 10 stories in the plan. Probably also because each story is a little different for practical reasons. But also when you have windows, you don't have a for loop in the plan that says, this window 20 times, you draw the same window 20 times. So what we're really seeing here is when we look at that picture, that plan is much more detailed. It's almost like the precise instructions of how to build something, which is when you think about it, more akin to how we write code. This is more really like instructing the computer to do something. And maybe that's not completely surprising then when we think, what do we call the phase when the software, when the source code is compiled and made ready for deployment on production system? We call it the build. So basically what we're doing for a long time with the source code we're writing, but now increasing the also with infrastructure as code, we are doing the same things, those plans. We are creating the plans. The actual building phase is done entirely by the computer. When you think about it that way, you come to the realization that what these people are doing is exactly what the software developers are doing. So the people who are programming, who are writing the source code, the infrastructure people who are writing the infrastructure as code scripts and other descriptions, they are the ones who are doing the plans. They're not the building people. So in many ways, this metaphor is really quite misleading. 
also, if you think about the real world, an architect is more like a business analyst. He's talking to the customers. He's finding out what they need. He's not the one writing the detailed plans. That is all interesting already, but I think the biggest issue with the metaphor is that the term architect in the building industry, what we, the connotations are there for most people who are not completely in the IT industry all the time. The architects are focused on the construction phase. When the building is finished, when the tenants have moved in, the architecture is done. But that's not the case. If you think about your enterprises, your businesses, how much does software really change? I would argue it changes a lot. It's never really finished. This skyscraper at some point will be finished. You're not going to add 20 new stories to it. You're not going to change the ground floor. You're not going to change the shape. You're not going to change the color and all these things, the materials. But that's precisely what we do with software. So we have to be really, really careful that we're taking these metaphors, that we don't mentally put ourselves into the wrong state, that we take what we intuitively know from the world about about building architecture and apply that thinking accidentally almost to our perception of what we do with software because it will mislead us. This is a known problem. This has been a problem for many years. I've actually used this picture even 10 years ago. And one thing that I have seen is that some people have said, what are better metaphors? And one thing that struck me over the years is this one. Some people have said, I feel more like a gardener. Yes, every now and then I'm planting new plants, but the vast majority of time I'm actually looking after the existing garden. I'm looking, at after, I'm looking after the plants that were there many years ago. The plants are also changing. I need to have a plan of how the change of the, sorry, the change of the plants over time actually makes my garden look like, makes the, the, um, the business that I have about maybe growing crops or so on, how that actually works. And also, what is part of that metaphor is to say, let's weed out some old plants. Plants wither and die. We have to have a plan for that too. And I think this is a much better metaphor if you think about it. Also, I mean, I've been involved with a lot of strategic IT. If you look at where the budgets are usually spent in enterprises, the vast majority is on maintenance and not so much on what is often even called R&D. But the architecture metaphor really focusing, focuses only on one thing. The question is, why don't we call ourselves gardeners? I've seen a few people do that, very, very few. I really think it's a very simple answer. Our craving for prestige. Architect is a much more prestigious title and we identify ourselves much more with being an architect than with a gardener. But if you're talking about the honesty of what we're really doing, I think this is much closer to, to the work that we are doing. And by the way, I'm not encouraging you to change your job titles if your job title is architect to gardener. It can be a thought provoking thing to do to start this conversation. I think we have to accept that that is what we call it, but I do believe we need to be aware of the bias. And this is, I'm gonna present you four conclusions. This is the first conclusion. Architecture is a tricky and to a certain extent even dangerous metaphor. You have to be mindful of what connotations you're arising and be mindful that you might set yourself off in a way of thinking that might not be the best way of thinking when it comes to complicated software systems. I briefly want to check. Ah, sorry, I just saw a chat message. I just wanted to make sure that there were no questions. I would encourage you anyway to ask those questions on Slack. I will be joining Slack after I finish the talk and I'm happy to stay on for a while, half an hour or longer to answer many of your questions. So moving back to the actual presentation. Now that we talked about architect, the term, and what it means for us, let's talk about what the architects are actually doing. And one thing that I've seen quite a bit is architects are creating abstractions. They're saying, I, as an architect, my role is not to be in the code. Oftentimes you hear people saying, I get my hands dirty. By the way, interesting, that sounds like the garden, gardener metaphor again, right? But what I've often seen is that architects are saying, I want to talk about creating frameworks so developers can't make mistakes or in a more trusting environment so developers are more productive. We create these common frameworks, we create these abstractions that other people can build upon. I would argue that's not a bad idea, abstractions are good. Without abstractions, nothing in computer science would be where it is today. But again, we need to be conscious that the abstractions and what we are doing with the term abstractions are well understood. This here is 
in pseudocode an example from a real engagement that I worked on many, many years ago. The idea here really was, if you think about a website that presents images that need to be tagged, so a tag could be something like a building, could be tagged Singapore, could be tagged people, right? So the images needed to be tagged. And there was a functionality in the admin part of the application to see which of the tags that were created in the taxonomy were not used. And this was the code, as I said, this is pseudo code, but that was the code that was written. So you're iterating in the for each loop over all the tags, and then you're saying tag.images.count. I'm going from the tag to the images, and if the count is zero, obviously the image is not used, and then I'm sticking the tag into the collection of unused tags. This is implemented in a high-level programming language. The images are stored in some data store. Let's, for the sake of the argument, assume it's a relational database. And we can see here, it's obviously some object relational mapping technology that is being used. But do you, can you imagine immediately what is happening here? Let's take a tag that is probably used quite a bit, like news or Singapore. So tag.images will trigger a load of all the images that belong to the tag into memory. Then in memory, the collection is being counted very quickly. Of course, the algorithm decides the count is 20,000 and not zero and moves on. But effectively, while doing this, you are bringing the entire database into memory. The person who wrote the code wrote the right code from a programming perspective, but they were unaware of the abstraction underneath. They saw the abstraction and they programmed according to the rules that the abstraction presented, but did not realize what they were doing. Luckily, we have performance tests that very quickly showed the issue. And by the way, in later years, when we revisited stories like this, people said, ah, yeah, but that was because this was more procedural. Today, everything is better because we use functional programming. And to be honest with you, this is, again, pseudo code, maybe slightly closer to Java. In a more functional approach, I'm creating a stream of all the tags, and I'm using a filter and an anonymous function. But you see, it's the same problem. t.images.count, same thing. I'm writing idiomatic code in the abstraction that I'm operating on, now functional programming, and still the underlying implementation of that abstraction still kills me, if you will, because t.images still eagerly, sorry, lazily loads all the data into RAM. I still need to understand the programming paradigm at that level of abstraction doesn't help me. The problem really is in the implementation of the abstraction. Another example, real world example, this was from a financial institution. A quote here is a quote for a possible deal. Quote message, as you can see in the top line, was a Java object in that case, and the developers could work on that level. That was built on an abstraction layer that converted that quote message into some format on another abstraction layer that made that into a message on the message bus. The message bus was implemented somehow. There was another abstraction layer before it hit the operating system. And then at some point, it hits the network stack in the operating system kernel, Linux, most likely. And what do we see here? That is what the interface definition of the network is. And what's happening now is you have a very high level of abstraction. You have that quote message where you can say, what currency, what instrument am I trading at the very top? And then at the very bottom, you have this number, MTU the maximum transfer unit, 1,500 bytes on Ethernet normally. And what was essential for this trading system was that it was fast, but it meant all the messages needed to fit into a single packet on Ethernet. So at the moment, you don't notice that. You change one field in the quote message on the Java level. You're adding one instance variable. And now the serialized, through all these layers of abstraction, the serialized message format, goes from 1,480 bytes to 1,540. You don't think about that at all when you're dealing in the Java land. But on the network level, you've now split the packets, and you're creating a huge issue because you need to reassemble the packets, you need to look at sequence, and so on. So again, you really, really cannot forget about how your abstraction is implemented. And if you talk about architecture as saying creating abstractions, that's a good thing. But to say we create abstractions and nobody needs to know what happens underneath, that is a very, very slippery slope. Another thing, another story. I was working with a large company. Maybe some of you recognize the visual identity. Windows phones aren't really a thing anymore. But what we were building, we were building the API for all of these applications, places, like the restaurant that you see there in London. 
How many stars does it have? Where are the restaurants on the map? Or if I said, for example, I'm limiting this to restaurants of a specific cuisine, I only see the restaurants of that cuisine, or in the case, as you can see in the middle in the search there, I want to have dining here. So this application running on mobile phones, you can see at the bottom running on websites, on photo reviews and so on, that needs an API at the back end. And how do you build this? We have a lot of theory around REST, around hypermedia as the state of, as the engine of application state and so on. There's a lot of theory, there are maturity models. We were aware of all of them. And yet we consciously and knowingly violated them on an architectural perspective. This is, and you can actually see probably from the screenshot how old the browser is. Again, this is many years ago, and it was already a problem here, not a problem, a point of discussion back then. So this is the real search result. If I did rest, I would not do most of this. I would probably, you can see this at the very bottom, the results have items, and at the very bottom you see the type and the type is here correctly, I would argue, is a hyperlink. So you can get actually more information about the type of the response. And then the href, where is the response? This should be where I can find the search results. This would be proper rest. And what have we done? We have included information like the icon. Doesn't belong there. The icon would belong into the resource of the actual search result that is hyperlinked at the bottom. We've included some information about the vicinity. You can see that at green towards the bottom. Like, where is it in Berlin? Why would that be in the search results? The search results shouldn't include that if you follow REST. That should definitely not be in there. Even worse, if you look further up, in the result, we've repeated the position that was, in, was given to the server. Why would we repeat that? Because it makes it easier for the applications. What we've also done is the distance. Why would we include the distance in meters? Normally, that can be calculated. You have the geolocation of the user and the client application. The server tells you where the place is. Why would we do the calculation? Why did we do it? We wanted that API to gain acceptance. We wanted people to use the API, and we wanted that they didn't have to go to Wikipedia and look up the formula how to calculate distance between two lat longitude pairs and wanted to do the work for them. Similar, we included the category. Because again, if you think about it, if the map that I showed you, if here, for example, this is a bar or pub, if you want to show different icons on a map, you quickly have a one plus n problem. You do the search, and if you follow through rest, the information would only be hidden, hidden, would only be in the actual resource. You would not only do the one search, you would do for each of the search results, do a specific request to find out more information. And that is clearly unacceptable for the user. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have ideas, and I'm not saying they're wrong. We have ideas about architecture, but we need to understand what is more important is user experience of the system we are building, and we have to judiciously deviate from architectural principles. We have to understand why they're there. We shouldn't just recklessly throw them overboard or say we don't care, but they don't rule. What rules is, in the end, the user experience. And having a search result include those items so I can display them on the map within two seconds is way better than doing pure and clean and rest by the book and take half a minute to show the user the results. That means, of course, and that's my second conclusion, architecture and development cannot be separated. You have to understand what the impact is when you're implementing the architectural pattern. You can't just sit there and say, the architecture says, we need to have rest. Look at the book about rest look about the maturity model and implement it that way and follow that to the letter. You have to understand the developmental impact. And I would go even further in the example I shared with you, we also did some actual measurement of how it performed in the real world. And we noticed on the 3G and nowadays LTE networks, it didn't make a difference from a latency perspective, whether you transmitted one kilobyte or 15 kilobytes. So it was actually using something at even a lower level on how the network stack was implemented, or maybe even the, the back end of the mobile phone network, that we exploited by saying, by, rather than sending one kilobyte of search results, we can enrich the search result up to a level of 15 kilobytes and provide more information in the same response, because it doesn't increase the response time and yet creates a much richer user experience. So architecture was informed by something that, and I showed you that on the network level as well, Architecture at the high level was informed by implementation details 
on a level like, I don't know, five, six abstraction layers down. So you can't separate them. You can't do architecture up front and then implement it. You need to understand how you implement it and then that changes your architecture. I will come back to that very, very much later in this talk when I'm saying that even sometimes the cloud cost, the cost that you need to pay for resources in one of the public cloud providers can also impact your architecture. And again, I would argue it's the right thing. But then if I'm saying architecture and development can't be separated, if I'm saying architecture is a dangerous metaphor, what most developers are doing would be similar to what architects in the building sense do in the real world. What do architects normally do? And one of the things I've seen a lot is design diagrams. And again, we have done this for many years. We've looked at visualization of what was actually implemented. And this here is a real example of a system. This is actually a standard Spring, Spring Boot application. And what we're seeing here is the individual context. And of course, you can't read this on your screens. The individual white boxes are components as part of a Spring architecture. And the black lines are showing the true dependencies between them. And what I would argue is that this is a mess that most developers can't keep in their head. The architectural diagram looks like this. There was a view controller layer, business object, security, across those two layer and data access objects at the bottom. I think it's not bad to have this diagram, but I think that diagram alone is not sufficient. That data access objects, you can see on the right-hand side in that more vertical box, these are all the data access objects. The business object is the layer at the very top of the diagram, but you can see that maze of dependencies between them. And that is what is not shown in the architecture diagram. So what I would argue is you can draw diagrams. And maybe somebody should draw that diagram. But this is a tiny fraction of the real work. And again, it is only a conceptual picture that doesn't really help you very much in the majority or in, in the phase of your engagement when you're building the software. What really helps you there is a true understanding. You have to diagnose what is wrong with this picture. Because that picture here is so agreeable that hardly anybody will object to. So be a bit mindful of design diagrams that are down front. Also, I would always argue that at least half the time, if not more often, the design diagrams that exist on the wikis, on Confluence, wherever you store them, often are outdated and don't resemble what is actually implemented. And these visualizations that I showed you, they don't lie because they show you what is actually implemented. Unfortunately, the truth is often a bit more ugly. So other things, design patterns. I think this is a very well covered area we're not inventing many new patterns, and I would argue that developers should be familiar with the patterns and be able to pick the patterns. Similarly, I talked about frameworks. Who's writing the frameworks today? Most of the frameworks we use are being harvested from real use, be that at Google, at Facebook, at some of the Silicon Valley giants, other organizations. They're usually open source software that we are pulling in. And again, should an architect really make the choice what framework to use, or should that be the developers who understand the constraints of the actual implementation much better? Especially bearing in mind what I said earlier, that the implementation of the framework needs to be known that the abstraction is good, but you need to understand how it is implemented. Other artifacts that go into the process, I'm not talking about the artifacts that come out of the build that get deployed. I'm talking about the artifacts that go into the software development process are the code. And I like that idea. A lot of people that I've seen have called themselves coding architects to emphasize the fact that they're also writing code, that they live with the consequences of their designs, that they don't stop at the diagram with the four boxes I showed you, but that they understand the consequence and understand the diagram that I also showed you with the hundreds of lines and hundreds of boxes that are connected by all those lines. I like that idea. Code is an important artifact, but if you're a coding architect, you could also say you're an architecting developer. I think it becomes one and the same thing, really. And then, of course, tests. Tests are a hugely important artifact. If you ask me what is the best thing you can do to become a better IT organization, I would say test automation. But again, here, the tests need to be done hand in hand between developers and people who wear a hat of quality assurance. I don't think you should outsource this. And I think hardly anybody would agree or would say that it's the role of software architects to write tests. So. That brings me to maybe the most controversial of my four conclusions, and that is most of what architects have done traditionally should be done by developers or by tools, these visualization tools, or maybe not at all. I'll let that sit with you for a second.
So, but why have, do we have such a fascination with architects? As I said, one is clearly, and I'm, I apologize for saying it so bluntly, but clearly prestige. There is an idea that there's a career path that once you hit a glass ceiling as developer, you have to become an architect to progress in your career. But I think there's something much, much deeper in this. And that has to do with the idea of how we human beings talk about evolution and how we think about complex systems. I guess many of us know how evolution works. We actually see with the COVID pandemic at the moment how that virus also evolves over time. There's a lot of fascinating things we can even remind ourselves. But I often got reminded of it when I, when I look at, say, when, I, when my son was younger and we went to the zoo and we saw monkeys in the zoo and I knew 90% of the DNA of a chimpanzee was the same as our DNA. It is hard to imagine. Sometimes it feels a bit odd too, doesn't it? It feels uncomfortable. Then when I talk about evolution, and you've seen the picture of that man on the picture for a while now, this is not Charles Darwin. It is actually a person called William Paley, and he lived way before Charles Darwin. The, pick, the reason why I have him here is he wanted to prove that God exists. And he came up with this idea, and he said, if you walk along a country path and you stumble across a mechanical watch, what would you think? Where did this watch come from? Did it poof, just come into existence? Or did a maker have to do this? And he was arguing that because these watches don't just appear out of nowhere, there needs to be a maker. And his line of argument then continued to say, if something as complex as a human being exists, it also does just come into existence. There needs to be a maker who created that complex organism. And that of course was then his conclusion that God must exist because who else would have created the human beings? There are many flaws in this argument. I don't want to debate, but I think the underlying idea is clear. As humans, we are uncomfortable with complex systems just appearing. We believe there needs to be some unified single force behind it to create these systems. This is in popular culture. I mean, this is from the Matrix movies. They have the architect even. Who is behind all of this? The architect. This is just such so ingrained in us that we believe that must be the case. But I have hope for you. It's a metaphor I've used for a long time also, town planning. I think this makes it very clear to many people. A town, and this is a model of London, a relatively contemporary model of London, that is a complex organism, if you will, a complex achievement of human civilization. And it didn't just spring into existence. It evolved over several thousand years. And of course, nobody can say that whoever founded Rome, you could argue whether it was the people who lived there first, or maybe the Roman Empire 2000 years ago when they formally founded whatever formally means in that case, whenever they formally founded London, they didn't plan, they didn't have a plan for what London would look like 2000 years later. They came up with something that worked for them at the time. Of course, they were visionary enough to think ahead a little bit of how it could possibly evolve, but nobody can tell me that they knew what it would be needed 2000 years later. And yet we have a complex and reasonably functioning city. You could always argue traffic jams are a bane, Maybe you can do something about the traffic jams, but I would even argue, and I've seen those, for example, I lived in Australia for a while. If you look at Canberra, which is a planned city, that doesn't solve the issue. Adding more lanes to a highway will just attract more traffic. So what we are arguing is that a functioning system like a city of London could be created over time, it evolved. The cool thing though is there are some things we can learn if we accept this town planner metaphor from the town planners because they do have rules. They didn't say precisely what needed to go where, but they have rules. They're talking about, say, something like a conservation area, an area where old houses exist and they must stay that way. You can see some parks here. These are protected. You can't just change them. You can't put an industrial factory in the middle of a residential area. They're the, these so-called zoning laws. But even then, what we're seeing over time, these zoning laws are changing. For a while, there was a big segregation, offices in one part of the city, and then leafy suburbs where people would live. We're seeing how, as we learn more and how fashions change, that is also changing. Now we're trying to get more apartments back into the area. We want to move offices a bit further out. So even though we have rules at a higher level, even those rules are evolving over time. But in the remainder of my talk, I want to go a bit more into those rules, into what we can learn from the town planners.
But maybe before I do that, the fourth and final conclusion that I wanted to present, architecture is mostly, or probably even exclusively, an ongoing activity. It is unlike the building architecture, an upfront thing that happens in the construction phase. The construction phase of most IT landscapes is never finished. If you talk about enterprises, if you talk about all sorts of other areas, maybe one small niche case that I'm aware of are video games. These are sometimes often finished, many of them anyway. You write them, you sell them, maybe a few patches, downloadable content, but they're mostly finished. That's an exception. But for most of the IT, and I guess most of you work in enterprise IT, I would argue that you don't have a construction phase like with a skyscraper and then use a phase where that is being used. So coming back to this idea of town planning, of having a large complex system that evolves over time, that adapts to the needs of its users, the inhabitants of the city, the e-commerce and so on, how would that look like? Let's talk about microservices. If we talk about architecture, oftentimes you have people, you have architects who then say, I want to focus on the macro architecture. And it starts often innocently. Somebody says, REST, HTTP, JSON. And I talk to you at length about what REST does actually mean when you talk about implementation. But what happens then is, okay, the people who are writing the microservices are saying, well, sure, HTTP, JSON, we put some endpoint on our microservices, all done. But then the slippery slope starts. Then you start getting to pictures like this. People are saying, I don't care about the micro architecture, about what's happening inside the microservices. Hopefully they're not building frameworks that must be used across all microservices. But the architects are then saying, I want to look at the macro architecture. And then categorizations appear, like that service E that I have in here, the echo service. That's a backend for front end because I suddenly have a mobile interface and it doesn't want to call the different services, like what I told you, violating REST, for example. Or we have services G and F. They are different type of service. They only provide data to other microservices. A, B, C, and D are still normal microservices. But then we have API gateways. We have a user interface layer and so on. And suddenly the entire debate and the entire argument is happening on that level, but in the end, this is the wrong level because what we really care about is implementing business functionality. If we get stuck in arguing, is this a backend service? Is service F, should that be purple on the diagram or in this turquoise color? Then we're having all these fruitless discussions that I guess many of us have been involved in and are so frustrating because we're not solving business problems with that. We are debating at a high level architectural concerns that don't really help us achieve the goals. Of course, it is aware. I'm not saying you should not know what a backend for frontend pattern is. I'm not saying you shouldn't talk about reuse of data access layers. I understand that. But what I'm saying is the, the conversations we're having shouldn't be focused around that. You should reduce all of that to the minimum background noise. You should probably have a guild. You should have people. You should have people focusing on architecture that are implementing the services. They should come together on a given cadence every week, every second week and debate these concerns. There's much more to be had here in that space about what those discussions can look like, but it shouldn't be in the foreground. It shouldn't be deemed the most important thing. The most important thing is to deliver business value, not pretty diagrams. And ultimately I could, I, I debated with myself to, whether to put the sentence on the slide. I'm only gonna tell you that. You should really focus on what you want. And that is what your users and your business wants. These diagrams focus on how to achieve it. That's not unimportant, as I said earlier. It's not the most important thing, though. So how do you focus on what you want when it comes to these concerns over how to achieve it? And that is the idea that has been crystallized much more over, the, over recent years, and I would argue very well explained in the book some of my colleagues have written, called Building Evolutionary Architectures. And this, on the right-hand side of the slide, is their definition of an evolutionary architecture. It says it supports guided incremental change across multiple dimensions. We've talked quite a bit, or I have talked quite a bit about incremental change. Across multiple dimensions, I can explain easily, this is look at performance, look at security, look at all different areas. Often these are called the non-functional requirements, the cross-functional requirements, or sometimes for short, the illities, because most of those words on illity scalability and so on. 
What I want to focus on, going back to the town planning metaphor, is this word here, guided. How do you guide the evolution of a complex system? Assuming you're on board with my idea of saying that these systems have to evolve, that you can't plan them up front. And this is something that Rebecca, who is one of the co-authors of the book, our CTO, is probably not so surprising because she also knows about evolutionary computing. And what we have there are these so-called fitness functions. This is a picture actually from a video game, but it gives you an idea. What people have tried to do is with genetic programming, they have said there's a fitness function. And on this screen, you can see several of them. At the top, you see the budget. This bridge here consume or can be built in this model. Of course, this is the only model for 22,000 game dollars. And at the moment, you can see the red car creates 64.8% of structural load on the bridge. If that reaches 100%, the bridge collapses. So here we have two fitness functions. We are saying it needs to hold the car, it can't collapse, and it needs to be cheap. It needs to stay in the budget. And what happened is these fitness functions were then given in evolutionary computing to genetic programming, and the algorithm would find the best solution. And this was actually also used for real-world bridges, and the bridges looked even weirder than that one. And people realized there was another fitness function. It needs to look trustworthy to human beings. But that's beside the point. The idea really is you can see in this bridge example, there are different fitness functions and sometimes they're contradictory. I can make a rock solid super stable bridge, but I might exceed the budget. The key goal is to find the trade-offs. And that's exactly what we see in computer science and in enterprise computing as well. We have these requirements that are often hard to meet at the same time. One is easy to meet, but multiple at the same time can be tougher. So this is the definition of evolutionary computing. So it's this objective function that summarizes how close the design solution is to achieving the set of aims, as I showed you with the cost, with the budget for the bridge, as well as the structural integrity. We can vary this and say an architectural fitness function provides an objective integrity assessment of some architectural characteristics. And that's what I said, performance, reliability, these are the characteristics. And I recognize that this sounds awfully abstract. I guess the fitness function concept is relatively clear, but how do I do this? You have these concerns, you have stakeholders in your business who say, this thing must be up 24 seven, we want five nines, all these statements that come out. How do you get that into a fitness function? So I want to spend the next few minutes to talk about some fitness functions to give you an idea of what they can look like. And I've chosen deliberate, there's many, many of them. I've chosen a few that give you an idea of the breadth to, to kind of spur your imagination a little bit. So coupling is an important one. We often talk about coupling and layering. This can even be, and this is a true example, minus of course the renaming of the packages, this can even be done in real code. There's JDPend, which is a Java-based um, package that allows you to define, and you can see that in the top lines here, the persistence web util, they're defined as packages. And this is actually looking into your real code, into the real implementation. And then I can say in the lines further down, persistence is allowed to depend upon utility, and web is also allowed to depend on utility. Then I'm saying JDPend analyze, this is where it's running. And then I'm saying, is it true that my constraints are matched? And here I have a fitness function. We have an architectural principle that says we don't want a dependency on web and persistence. This is not allowed. But rather than drawing that into a diagram, writing it on a wiki, we are putting that into a fitness function that I can run, run as part of my build. So here I have a very, very simple, very easy to understand fitness function. It would be ideal if I could show you 20 of them, but time doesn't permit. I'll give you a different one. This is actually, and I must say this, this slide is not my slide. It's purely copied from public resources from Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference in 2019. What Apple does is it allows the, the authors and the organizations behind applications to measure certain things in production. And here, what we see is this is launch time. How long does it take to launch a mobile, phone app a mobile application on your iPhone? And the developers do get the data back from Apple. And what you can see here is you can see the application versions on the bars from 1.0 to 1.0.8 on the right-hand side. And they are measuring the launch time. And the fitness function here could be something, the launch time itself, but you could 
introduce a threshold to say, if that goes over 1,500 milliseconds, my application is not fit for purpose. It takes too long and our users will abandon the application. So what you're doing then is you're saying, I'm measuring an objective thing. How long does it take? You're not even measuring this in development. You're actually measuring this in production. You're moving this into production. And then you say, okay, but isn't that irresponsible? Isn't that too late? You could argue maybe. But if it is in a small scale like here, you can see, oh, we maybe went overboard in the field, the application takes too long, and you can spend the next development cycle to actually improve, you can put a priority on improving the load time, the startup time of the application. And then hopefully when version 1.0.9 comes out, you can actually demonstrate in clear business value what your real users are seeing, that your application is now fitter for purpose again. Very similarly, Resilience, everybody wants to talk about resilience. How do you know your system is resilient? You're trying to break it. Netflix made available the Simeon Army, open source software that allows you to misconfigure and destroy instances in your production environment. On the right hand side, I've shown you something from a software as a service system called Gremlin that does something very similar. The idea with chaos engineering is to, to stand by your words, to say, I'm not only architecting a resilient application, I'm demonstrating to everybody, my stakeholders and everybody in production, it is okay to kill a few microservices because that's what could happen if Amazon loses one region, but I demonstrate that it does actually work. This is a matter for an entire talk. If you've not come across the concept, I would strongly advise you to read up on it. The last example, oops. The last example I want to show you is this here, dependency drift. Many of us are using open source software packages, and I mentioned them earlier, oftentimes published by the Silicon Valley giants. This here is Angular, for example, coming out of Google. And oftentimes we are in an enterprise context that lives by the enterprise rules, but we are taking open source software that lives by the Silicon Valley rules. And that often is a cause of problems. What I'm seeing here is, this was a real world example again, an application that uses version 7 of Angular. You can see this in many, many different places here in the output. You can see it uses Angular animations, current major version used in the engagement is version 7. Available, made available from Google is version 10. If you then look at the documentation, you will see that version 7 is not really supported anymore. Google only support, I mean, this is maybe an edge case but nine and eight are probably supported better. If you were in version six, you would definitely have a problem. So your dependencies are drifting. You're drifting behind. You don't spend enough time keeping up to date. You think, oh, we chose version seven when we started the, the project, when we started this product, that was good. Never change a running system. But the internet giants, they change and they make the improvement and security changes only in the newer versions. So you really, by accepting their frameworks, you have to accept their way of working and you have to stay current. If you don't believe me, this is the true output from that system. And you can see in the top line, I'm running NPM audit, the node package manager. And at the very bottom, you can see 1,854 vulnerabilities found. I'm three major versions behind. I'm behind from version 10 to version seven. You could argue this is all small fry, it doesn't, occur to, uh, it doesn't concern me, but you see also hopefully in that picture, 23 of them are high impact vulnerabilities and one of them is enough to cause a major data leak in your business. So again, dependency drift says how fit your system is to be actually secure running into production. So I've shown you coupling, performance, resilience, dependency drift. There are many others, I alluded to them, cloud cost, license compatibility. There are so many fitness functions you can think about. And I think if you will, the role of an architecture team, of a team who talks about architectures, maybe to think about how you can translate the ideas that you have, the business requirements of your systems into these fitness functions. Like the town planners, they have ideas about how the city should evolve and they come up with these rules about how the town should evolve. They're not telling you how to build the building, but they're telling you rules that can be measured of how the outcome should look like. And that brings me to the last thought of this talk, Maybe if we talk about architects, maybe architects are guides. Like that person in the picture here with the hat, he's bringing the tourists through the jungle. He doesn't carry them across the river. 
And he's probably pointing at a bird or some animal in a tree. He's showing them where that animal is, and it is up to the people to look at it. He's not climbing up the tree, carrying down the bird and holding it in front of them. The architects should not be, and unfortunately I've heard this, they're not parents, they're not protecting the people. I think they should guide them. And I really honestly believe these ideas of fitness function in an evolving architecture are the closest we've gotten to, to that image, to that idea of guiding people to do the right thing, but guiding the people who are up to their neck in the actual implementation to guide them to do the right things. And that is my overall summary. Thank you so much, Eric. I truly enjoy your analogies. Wow. Uh, next time, if someone asks me what is architect, I have a lot of resource to answer and I love your analogies for sure. And what a coincidence today, actually in Doha, Singapore, we are having this um, chill discussions talking about all the titles where uh, we were saying we don't have to put our official title in our name card and what are some of the interesting things we like to put on our name card. So from gardeners to coding architects to guys, wow, so many inspirations. And I really love how you go down to the core reality of what exactly we are doing as architect and um, tear off all the prestige layers on top of it. Thank you so much for this uh, show, Eric. I really, really enjoy it. Uh, so 